Well, thank you. I'm really impressed with the number of people who have an interest in Mackinac history. Thank you for coming. Um, tonight we're going to talk about um, the Agatha Biddle Band of 1870. Now that's not a rock group. <laughs> that is the annuity payment that was made in 1870 to her band, um, which was the last one for the majority of the people. There was, there was another one. Um, the last one was done in 1872. Now I was told you guys like lots of pictures, <laughs> so I'm going to go jump right into the treaties here. Now the annuity payment was the result of two treaties, and. Um, um, the um, first treaty was done in 1836, um, I don't know why that says 1837, but it was 1836, Treaty of Washington, D.C., and all the yellow, well, I guess I have a pointer here, all the yellow, this area right here, was from the Treaty of Washington, D.C. Now, that air area was about 13.8 million acres. And at the time, a certain number of acres and at least 60,000 people were required for a uh, territory to apply to become a state. So they sent um, Schoolcraft up here and he was the Indian agent, and he and Lewis Cass, who was the territorial governor, um, managed to do this. They submitted the, the approved treaty to Washington, and Congress added a stipulation to it that the lands that they were given were only good for five years. They were thinking about moving everybody. Uh, so they came back and um, the Indian chiefs were really upset and so there was no development of the land. If they were going to get taken away <coughs> from the land, why should they develop it? So um, all this time passed and um, there was still no decision to remove people. Um, so, in 1855, a group of Ottawa and Ojibwe sued the government and um, asked them to tell them definitively, are we moving, are we staying? Because they had sent a group of people out of the tribes out to um, Kansas and Missouri and out west and they had decided on some space. But everybody else, they didn't want to go. Why should they have to go? So, I mean, it a, was a lightly populated area. However, with the addition of the Erie Canal that allowed more and more people to get to the Great Lakes Waterway and come where the government was giving away land, so there was some encroachment on where the Indians were. And um, so 1855 rolled around and they decided that, you know, we need a treaty, definitive treaty. So they met in Detroit and it was called the Treaty of Detroit, 1855. And the Indians sued the government and the accounting office determined that there were unpaid annuities due them from the 1836. So, in 1855, they, they added another 10 years, which ended up being 14 years, of annuity payments. So, there was a whole generation from 1837 to 1872 that lived on these annuity payments. Mm. Um, the children were sent to schools to try and forget, you know, their local customs, their language. 
uh, anything that had to do with being Indian. They wanted them to be Christian. They wanted them to um, speak English. And um, gladly that uh, didn't happen, that the culture was not eradicated. Um, so after 1855, um, the annuities continue to this group. And what makes Agatha Biddle's group so special is that she is... Ah, okay, I'm going to step back then. Um, I put this in there to show that people people who got their annuities on Mackinac Island also came way out here to Cross Village, oops, way down there to Sheboygan, and way out up here to um, Epiphet and Brocap and um, the different places out there. You can see St. Helena Island was a huge um, fishing island. The Newton brothers ran that. Um, so, these are pictures of early Mackinac, um, just to show you what Mackinac looked like when the ladies lived there. The first one in this upper corner here was done by Anna Jameson, who was an English woman, and she was a feminist, and uh, um, she came by herself from London, hired somebody, they went by canoe, they went through Canada, they went on the Great Lakes, and while she was here, she had a number of um, sketches that she herself did. This one here in the, the upper corner shows Fort Mackinac, that's Fort Mackinac, and you guys know that Fort Mackinac came from Michelin Mackinac in Mackinac City, right? They took it apart and dragged it across the ice. Okay, so down here, you can see this is the potato field, and right here, I don't know how well you can see it, is the agency house, which is right there. So that agency house was there for quite a long time if she did this in 1837. Um, and this is where Schoolcraft would have um, acted as the agent and the other Indian agents after him. This is where um, all the Indians would have received their uh, annuity payments and came in to complain about somebody, you know, any kind of wrongdoing. Essentially, Schoolcraft was the civil authority in a large part of Michigan and toward Wisconsin until the Indian agent was established at La Pointe. Then the next one is just a basic picture of downtown, dirt streets um, pointed toward the fort. The next one was done in the 1850s showing all the wharf and all the busy <laughs> things going on. Now right here, <coughs> I don't know how well you can see this, right here is this building right here with the columns. So it's just kind of nice to tie those in. And this picture on the lower um, left is the earliest known photograph of Mackinac Island. Now a little later, these are all photographs. Um, we've got the coal dock, and we can date this to the 1890s because the hotel is there. The hotel was done in 1887, so, and I don't see the, um, the Chippewa Hotel, which was put up in 1903. So sometime between uh, 1887 and 1903, this one was taken. Then uh, next to that, again, is 1890s downtown, and that is the post office that's down here in the front left. 
and they must have been waiting for something big to come to the post office. And then over here on the lower right is the fire brigade, and they're out front of one of the uh, uh, stables that's out there. There's so many pictures online of early Mackinac, it was really hard to choose, you know, which would be interesting to a big group. <coughs> okay, we have to talk about Mrs. Biddle. Um, her parents, her mother was from down in River Raisin. How she met up with um, De Levine, who was in northern Michigan, in Odawa, um, I don't know. But apparently she was supposed to be very beautiful, Marie was. So they married and um, she pretty much became a Catholic. She was very devoted to Catholicism, but De Levine was a medicine man and she apparently couldn't they couldn't mesh their religions couldn't mesh so they left she left with her two daughters and um, she married she married Joseph Bailey Marie did now Joseph Bailey was a big deal on Mackinac Island. I guess he was a loud, boisterous man. He was really wealthy. He was big in the fur trade, and he was he was an important man. So when Edward Biddle married Agatha, he was marrying more or less Bailey's stepdaughter, not an Indian woman. So they had four children. Um, Sophia, I found this um, romantic story about her that she um, attracted the attention of Lieutenant Pemberton from the fort. And it was a big deal on the island because the soldiers had beautiful uniforms and you know the weddings were really special. And he wanted to marry her, but she wouldn't say yes until he went to meet her mother. When he met her mother, he saw that she was an Indian, and he severed all ties with Sophia. So later, she apparently died of TB. And um, the, the story that I came across was up at the Bayless. So it was real sad. John uh, married another woman whose mother is in the book. He uh, became wealthy, carried on, and had all the entree that his father could give him into fur trade. And uh, then it switched over to fishing society. Made a lot of money. Marie um, was about 10 years old. And an island story says that she fell through the ice and drowned. Then Sarah uh, married a man named Charles Durfee, and she stayed on the island. So Edward died, buried in the Protestant cemetery. And what they did with their family was the girls were all baptized in the Catholic Church. John stayed Protestant like his dad. So Edward is buried in the Protestant church and Agatha is buried in St. Anne's Catholic Cemetery. I have not found the exact year that Agatha became the chief uh, because I'm missing a couple of annuity payments, but it was sometime between 1861 and 1863. So, and she held that position until she died, 1873. Now, this was their house, and this was part of the original fort um, that was rebuilt, built circa 1780, and the Biddles didn't get it until about 1820. They didn't purchase it until about 1820. And um, it's a 
fairly large size house, but this is what it looked like for years and years before um, the state got it and um, revamped it. So this is what it looks like today. I'm sure many of you have been to the island. And um, <coughs> last year, they opened the new Native American Museum in the house. Now, I would, to start a controversy, I would think that the Indian dormitory would be the best place to have an Indian museum. The Indian dormitory is where the Manugians generously lend their artwork to everyone to see on the island. But that was originally part of the 1836 treaty. So why not have that for the Indians? I did come across a letter from 1855 and they wanted, they wanted to know, is that ours? Who owns that? I didn't find an answer. <laughs> okay, John Tanner, we got something special for him. Um, where do I push this button at? Give you a little break from my talking.
was catchy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have that chorus stuck in my head now. <laughs> All right, let me get you back to the slideshow. Okay. And there we go. Thank you. Okay, so John Tanner was quite a character. Um, he he was captured by the Shawnee, grew up with the Ojibwe woman. They he went from Red River, Winnipeg, and down to the Sioux, and he was caught in the middle of a game between Abel Bingham, the bishop, uh, the Baptist uh, minister and Schoolcraft. Now Schoolcraft was had the ego the size of Alaska and his brother James was a party boy. So whatever jobs he got it was because of his brother. Um, and uh, the story of Tilden was apparently uh, Tilden and James Schoolcraft were fighting over a woman. And that's why Tilden shot him. Um, Schoolcraft did some really bad things to John Tanner. And his daughter Martha, who was 18 at the time, was living with him up at the Sioux, keeping house. And for some reason, I've never read any um, information, any stories of abuse, you know, from anyone other than Schoolcraft saying that she was being abused. So through legislative process, he went that far. He had her removed and placed into the care of Benjamin K. Pierce, who was at Fort Mackinac. She ended up um, living with um, uh, Laframboise and was there where her mother was. Um, now, her mother was Indian. Her name was Teresa Quemacons. And the Schindler de Framboise household took her in and trained her how to be a housekeeper. So that way she could earn her living on Mackinac Island. Um, she also became a Catholic. And he wanted her to come back with him and she wouldn't until they got married in the Catholic Church. So they never did live together again. Anyway, Martha went to Ferry's uh, school, the Presbyterian school on the island, and she was such an adept pupil that they sent her down to the St. Clair Convent in Detroit. Um, from there, she went to Vincent's Academy, or St. Vincent's Academy, I've seen it both ways, and that was down in Kentucky, so she was able to uh, connect with her uh, Tanner relatives down there. So Martha came back to uh, the Mackinac area, and she was a teacher, and um, she taught in St. Ignace, she taught on the uh, island, she taught in Arbor Croche, um, the one story that I have about her, uh, when she got her assignment to teach in St. Ignace, um, they told her that she was not to teach the catechism, reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's all they wanted her to teach. And the father who was there, um, said, well, you can have this school here. You just need to fix it up while well, it was a wrap. And he also wanted to control what books she used and required for her to teach catechism. So she found another house in town, bought a little stove for it, and the priest got angry and told everybody in his parish, especially the Indian people, she was not to be trusted and not to go to that school. So she had quite a bit of struggles with him, and apparently they amended their difficulties uh, because later the children did come to school. Now, she was so angry with this father that when her mother died, 
and her sister named Lucy, who drowned in a, a boat that sank, um, was buried in the Protestant cemetery because she didn't want to deal with this priest. So then um, St. Anne's Cemetery used to be downtown on Mackinac Island, and it moved to its current location. So after it was moved, she had her mother and her sister uh, placed right near where her marker is, and it's right next to Tree Schindler's, if you've ever been, you know, walking around uh, St. Anne's Cemetery. So, um, you know, it would be interesting to see if they did one of those scans to see if they could find those, <laughs> those two graves. But Martha always remained single, and um, people seemed to take care of her. She was given life lease on um, the house that she was living in, and I found um, a woman named Corbier. Her father was a doctor on the island at the fort. He had treated Martha for breast cancer, and that's what she died of. Now, Susan Dacro, um, her family, um, the Davenports are all over the place. My relative. Your relative? Awesome. Um, is there anything you want to add? <laughs> I learned a lot. Okay. Um, uh, it says that she was born uh, near the Crow Wing Trading Post uh, in Minnesota, and um, her grandfather was supposed to be Wabajig, who was a big chief at La Pointe, and um, one of his daughters was supposed to be her mother. Um, she was married to uh, Davenport in um, 1835 at La Pointe. There is a new book out by Tim, I think his name is Tim Cochran, and he has looked at um, uh, diaries of Davenport and someone else, and there's a lot of good information about um, Ambrose when he was younger. Ambrose was the son of the Yankee rebel. If you've ever been to the island, there's a, a restaurant there that has his name. There's a lot of good information on their website um, that talks about Ambrose and how he refused to capitulate to the British when they took over the fort and made everyone prisoners of war. And they were sent to another place where they stayed for a while and they were finally let go. They were supposedly, they had to sign a paper saying they wouldn't take up arms against the British. So, but he made his way back to Mackinac. His wife, Elizabeth, was still there, and their kids um, were there. He owned a huge chunk of Mackinac Island where they farmed, and uh, Ambrose took up farming and his son, and um, at some point in time, he became the lighthouse keeper at Skelligalee. Um and they were buried in the Protestant cemetery after they died. What's up in the corner there is their um, marriage record from Justice of the Peace, I think. I'm not sure. But it was done at La Point. Now these are some of their children. It just shows um, their dedication to serving in the lighthouse service. Um, the one up in the upper left corner, Duclon, I am fortunate enough to go with my sister and her husband this summer in September and I'm going to go to that Eagle Bluff Lighthouse in Door County. I'm looking forward to it. This picture supposedly hangs in the lighthouse. Um, and he was there for 35 years after he served in um, the artillery from New York in the Civil War. And they had seven sons. So lots of good help there. 
And then um, John Davenport, another son, uh, also served in the lighthouse uh, service. I didn't uh, put which, which lighthouse it was, but they were in Michigan around Mackinac area. Okay, this lady came from the Red River area or even further. Uh, she was given to Michael Kedron, Michelle Kedron, when she was 14 years old to be wife. And her parents stayed, stayed there. Um, their eldest son was in Company K, uh, First Cavalry, under, oh, I think that's the next slide. Don't want to talk about that. <laughs> so, here's all their children. Um, she was a longtime nurse and midwife, worked for Dr. Bogan. And um, she married, is there anyone here from the newspaper? Okay, I can tell you. She married Frank Cadot, and a family member told me, but I couldn't put it in the book, told me that they think she killed him. <laughs> he, was, he was about 30 years younger than her. They had a great age difference. Um, and they weren't married very long. So with her being a nurse, I imagine they thought she did something to him. But I wasn't allowed to put that in the book, so. <laughs> so Sophie is buried in um, St. Anne's Cemetery. Um, in the annuity, her name is listed as Mrs. Michelle Cuthren. And there is no one by that name. That was part of the challenge of doing this book figuring out who these people were because the names were butchered. Um, and so I finally figured it out. That was this guy, Kadron. And um, there's another, um, another branch of this family that lives up in the Sioux. She was almost 100. Yeah. I see that. When, wow. if you look at her, death certificate. It says birthday, 1821. But then under year, month, day, it says 8972 or something. But it says she was only 89 years old. But right above it says 1821. So you don't know what, which is correct. That's 89 is still a long time to live in that. It yeah. is. It is, exactly. especially up there. And have kids for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's people who have had more. Oh, yeah. I think Mrs. Charbonneau has the record with 23 kids. Oh. 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 Some of them twins? No. No. <laughs> okay, um, this is uh, members of the Cadron family. Um, Michelle Cadron was their eldest, and he was enlisted in Company K of the Michigan 1st Cavalry, which is also known as the Wolverine Brigade. Um, I think probably a lot of you recognize Custer there. Uh, that was his... Um, that was his company, and that's how he managed to advance quickly. Um, he, let's see, I'm drawing a blank here, what I wanted to say. He was, he signed up for three years, but in the end, he was transferred to another unit, Company C. They were sent out west to quell the Indian problem. Now, this man was Indian himself. And a lot of other men in that company 
were Indian. Now supposedly they went from, uh, they got dropped off at Kansas and then they went to Montana and he was finally um, mustered out in Salt Lake City. I would really like to know <coughs> what those guys felt. You know, duty or brotherhood. You know, what did they feel having to go and attack other Indians like that? Um, he came back, he married uh, Mary Contine, and they lived up in the Sioux. Um, and he died uh, in 1921. Um, but, you know, what an interesting person he must have been. He was really different from other people who stayed in the same town his whole life, where he saw a great deal of the United States and saw quite a <coughs> lot of uh, ugly things, I'm sure, too. Now, um, going along with the uh, lighthouse, um, the two young men at the bottom there are Kadron's sons, and they have to be out fishing one day near Spectacle Reef, uh, which is down by Sheboygan. And um, or maybe I've got that wrong. I think it's Spectacle Reef. Um, anyway, uh, they were coming, the lighthouse keeper, first keeper, and assistants were coming to open up the lighthouse for the year in early April. Well, they ended up tipping, and they uh, fell in the water. The guys saw them and managed to save three of them. The gentleman in the middle, his name is Marshall, he lost his son. His son didn't uh, make it. They pulled him out of the water. and. He didn't make it. So uh, they were given the um, a special lighthouse annual award. Now, old lady bandana, this is the last of my talk here. I'll leave you with a little ghost story. Um, after she died, many people in the village, now Harrisonville on the island is called the village. Um, so many people in the village uh, saw her, and a lot of the parents used her as a, you know, like a boogeyman. If you don't watch out, the boogeyman's going to come and get you. And I have some actual accounts of people who have had uh, interaction with her. Now, I don't know if you guys know anybody from St. Agnes Mackinac Island, but the first one is from Darlene Olson. Boy, do I remember how we were all afraid of Old Lady Bandana, and the Burners is a place where all the garbage went to be buried and all the horses that died were burnt in the big furnace there along with paper trash located behind a local resident's house down a small path to the right of the house walk about a quarter block, and there it is. I wish it were summer, I would show you the spot. And from Lois Mackey, she wrote, we had what we called a ghost in the old house on the island. She would stand at the head of the stairs and just look at my brothers in the night. She was called Old Lady Bandana because she was dressed in a long dark cloak with a large bandana draped over her face and head. My brothers would holler down the stairs to her mom that she was there again, and mom would turn the light on to chase her away. <laughs> and the last one from John Cadot. Old Burners is where she is, kept us away from playing back there as kids. The parents all told us the old lady bandana stories. I never knew I was related to her. The old Burners is where the dump used to be in the village area. I believe they cremated the dead horses there also. Used to be an old building standing there when I grew up. Now a cement slab, the whole area is overgrown with vegetation now. Used to be trails all through there. We would ride bikes there, catch snakes, pick strawberries and raspberries. The building was a big concern, it was falling down. 
The story was that she lived in that building to try keeping us kids out. But kids will be kids, and we played in there anyway. With the old building being demolished, hopefully Sophie's spirit now rests in peace. Oh. So who, who did they think she was? She was um, Sophie Kedron. Or Kedat. So, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you.